Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 21 of uh, ENM 2020. This was a, a smaller week as far as uh, videos to, to watch. I uh, basically just had the misfortune of having to watch me talk about um, uncertainty. And as far as I'm concerned, the message from this week is a pretty simple one. Um, you don't just present a single answer, whatever you do in science. You wouldn't, if you were asked to, if you were asked how, how tall is a human, you wouldn't just measure one human and say you know, 1.8 meters. You might measure 100 humans or 1,000, and you would say it's 1.8 meters plus or minus 0.2 meters, right? You have to give an idea of uncertainty or you have to give an idea of variability. And then when we're doing kind of complex estimations, like you know, something that we don't know, like what is the, the area of distribution of a species, again, you have to say, you know, this part I'm certain of, and this part I'm not certain of. And so you have to translate the variability into how sure you are or how unsure you are about this, this prediction or this, this complex quantity that you're trying to estimate. So to me, it's kind of patently obvious. And yet, if you just get on the Google Scholar right now, and you know, type in ecological niche model and just look at the first 10 empirical papers that show up on that list, I'll bet you that eight out of those 10 don't present a view of certainty or uncertainty of their predictions. Mona and Marlon, do you think I'm exaggerating? No, it looks like you're right. I. I have been reviewing some papers lately, and I think just one of them presented something related to uncertainty <clears throat> out of 20, probably, during all this time that I've been reviewing. <clears throat> and that's, that's after we did the things in KUNM, and actually they use some of those examples. Uh, and that's interesting because, uh, as you said, Models are models, they are not right or wrong, but they may be better fit. And there are not just one answer that is that has a good fit to the data. And saying whether you are more certain or not on some prediction based on how variable it is, I think it's it's a huge deal. And we need to we need to be aware of that and, and just report it. Even if we cannot do like deep interpretations and those kind of things, reporting those kind of results is, is important. Yeah, I don't think we see, I, I haven't seen in papers um, like a common um, approach to reporting dispersion you talked about dispersion in your presentation down and yeah i mean there's it's it's common practice now to run multiple algorithms but we don't see the variation across those algorithms reported mm -hmm. in in papers i mean we see variation like auc uh you know like an average auc maybe a standard deviation but it's look the uh, the predictions are not yeah the, the variability uh, of predictions across uh, algorithms is rarely I haven't seen it well presented in uh, in papers maybe 10 15 years ago i got to i got to be in a uh, visualization immersion chamber and essentially what it was was the idea was to be able to visualize complex data, but visual only. And it was, it was pretty impressive. 
Um, I'm sure it's out of date. You know, what I saw was out of date compared to now. But essentially what it was, was, you know, among other things that they showed us, they showed us a map and the uncertainty in that map. And the way they showed us the uncertainty was to essentially wobble the features of the map that were more uncertain. And it was, it was very visually challenging because, you know, imagine whatever you're seeing right now, some parts of what you're seeing stayed very fixed because those were the ones that had low uncertainty and other parts were like vibrating. And it was very hard to look at. And apparently some people even get nauseous in those chambers. Um, but wouldn't it be neat if we could do that with the maps that we publish in journal papers, you know, where we, we have some really good way. Because typically what we do is we put, you know, the, the prediction and the uncertainty. And so what we do with our eyes is we go back and forth between the two. And that's not, we're not very good at that. It'd be really cool to find a way to overlay them. Maybe it's a matter of you know making things more more fuzzy. Anyhow, yeah. um, let's look at a, a couple questions, maybe. <clears throat> let's see. There we go. Okay. So let's, okay, could you please present and explain one or two formulas for calculating uncertainty? This is one of those things that's so simple that um, there's not really a formula. Um, what you're gonna do is you're going to find a way to generate multiple outputs from your analysis. Now, many of the platforms for analysis do replicate analyses. So for example, it might uh, work based on a different uh, initial subset of the data and produce a slightly different answer. And typically, we might run 10 replicate analyses. Well, one dimension of uncertainty is just to look at the range of values across those 10 analyses. And just that is going to be quite interesting. In fact, I guess we could even try this. Um, with Marlon's help recently, I've been running some analyses. Uh, we were using the KUENM package, which you will hear about in, I think, two weeks. Um, but I can go and get those results. And so you look in this final models, and let's just take one of the final models, so maybe this one. And you see we have, let's see, this is, a, this is based on Maxent, but Maxent, we had set it to give us 10 replicate analyses. So here's the first one, here's the second one, third one, all the way up to the 10th one, which would be number nine. And then notice we can immediately go to these, which are the summary statistics. And this you'll get from any max N analysis. There's the median value, but also here's the maximum and the minimum. And that's the maximum for every pixel across those 10 replicates. And so I can bring in the maximum value. 
and I can bring in the minimum value. Okay. And those are both things that range from zero to one. But then I can go to raster calculator and I can say, look at maximum minus minimum. And I need to call this something. I'll put it somewhere. And the interesting thing is we're going to see that different parts of this map have different amounts of uncertainty. So let's see, high values, highly uncertain are going to be in blue and zero uncertainty is going to be in red. And so what you can see is these areas, we're pretty certain that they are, um, we're pretty certain of what the value is. And I can show you the median value and show you, let's see. See, that is a zero value. So essentially, we are quite sure of those black areas being low suitability because there's essentially no variation around that zero suitability value. Let's zoom in a bit and we can see, sorry, areas of, this is a, a binary prediction of, of suitability, but we can see these areas have at least a lower, like around 0.4. But that's saying that across those 10 replicates, the highest value for any one pixel was 0.4 greater than the lowest value for that same pixel. Okay. I don't know where the greatest values of uncertainty are. Looks like they might be around these lakes where they're kind of some, some artifacts um, because there was some missing data. But my point is simply that we can look right away and say, well, this is an area that had very low variation from model to model. And this is an area that had somewhat higher. So that's a really, really simple approach to calculating uncertainty. You can certainly go a lot deeper than that. And uh, Marlon has built into KUENM several routines that I showed you at the end of my talk. And those, those take you deeper. They, they can answer questions like um, uncertainty due to what? Is it due to the different sampling of um, different sampling of occurrence data? Is it due to um, different modeling approaches or different modeling parameters? There are lots of sources of variability. And so we can, we can decompose that overall variation into different possible causes. Any comments, Marlon or, or Mona? Not on that. Uh, probably like just to follow that question, what other methods are in line 2452? There's a question that in brief says, uh, isn't the hierarchical partitioning analysis, which is the one that is a little bit more complicated than what Down showed, uh, similar to what an ANOVA is, in which you try to like, detect the amount of variance coming from the same factors? Yes, it is similar. And actually, it, it, as it says, it's using a GLM. Um, but the difference is that hierarchical partitioning doesn't assume uh, normal distribution of data and uh, homogen, homo, 
homostasticity. Is that the word? Homoskedasticity. Homoskedasticity, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is uh, that the variance stays mo mainly the same in all the the results that you are trying to consider. Uh, and yeah, that that's it's something similar. It's just uh, more directly applicable without assumptions. The other thing is uh, a multivariate analysis, um, like an ANOVA, uh, is going to look at a certain combination of variables. And hierarchical partitioning, as I understand it, is set up to look at all combinations of variables. Am I correct? I think it depends on how you establish the model, but yes, it's something, it's something like that. Uh, you be you have to be more specific in how the way to do it, like like the way to write it at the moment of doing it, it's a little bit different. So the hierarchical partitioning is done um, in KUENM package. Yes, it is okay. one of the the post pro, post modeling analysis that is implemented there. Very cool. There's a there's a um, paper that's only a preprint uh, mm -hmm. that Marlon and Luis Osorio and, and I did that was essentially about measuring uncertainty in, in niche models. And let's just say we, we submitted it to a couple places and it got rejected. And so we decided it was not worth the struggle to get it past reviewers because everybody has an opinion um, and so we just put it on bioarchive yeah and that's the paper you have on in your um presentation right. nice nice there there is a question about uh so relate i mean everything is related to uncertainty uh we started the first question you you selected town was about measuring uh how do we i think it was how do we measure uh, this one says, or how do we calculate? This one is on la in line 2406. <laughs> and it says, hi everyone, how can we measure the uncertainty associated with the rasters of the environmental variables and occurrence data? And so it's, al it's also, of course, because the topic is uncertainty, it's also talking about measuring uncertainty or um, assessing uncertainty, but of input data and occurrence data. We discussed un uh, uncertainty of occurrence data a while ago in the course. Um, so you can uh, there are ways to assess answers, uncertainty of uh, georeferencing of the occurrence data, uh, but there is also uncertainty related of occurrence data related to um, to identification, a source of, of occurrence data. So I think it's not a measure. I mean, it is a measure if you, um, if you um, georeference and measure the uncertainty of your georeference, you get a measure, but you can also report maybe uncertainty related to how many of the specimens were uh, well, uh, <laughs> Uh, identified, you know, if you used iNaturalist or, or citizen science data, how many of those were quality control and so on and so forth. So you can do that for occurrence data. For environmental variables, depending on the environmental variables used in the uh, model, um, I mean, the sources usually come with metadata and they tell you about a little bit about the uncertainty of those um, environment of the, those rasters that you are using. But for example, if you use world clean, um, there's not a measure of uncertainty um, associated with minimum, I don't know, or mean annual temperature. Um, so that's harder to assess. And we know that these environmental the climate data are the result of interpolation of meteorological station data. So, yeah, so it's hard to come up with a measure of uncertainty for 
you know, climatic variables. Well, I, I'm sure that a measure exists. It just is not provided to us. Yes. I mean, let's imagine we went back to the meteorological station data and made our own um, raster layers to summarize aspects of climate. There is certainly some measure of uh, goodness of fit or density of information or yeah. you know deformation or you know local residuals there's going to be something mm -hmm. that could be presented but isn't yeah it has to be dug up <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah now with the occurrence data Mona's totally right. There, there are so many dimensions of those data that that could be wrong. Um, it's a bit hard to work with. But with the coordinate uncertainty, if you look at the um, Ebola paper, which I believe I put up also uh, with this with this week's talk, um, that's an example of where we had uncertainty at the level of, you know, hundreds of kilometers down to tens of meters. And so what we've done in situations like that is very simple things like cast random points within the, um, the uncertainty radius accorded to each of the points. And so you can create replicate data sets each with each point being represented by a different random point representative of that point. Mm -hmm. And then you can see how much variation exists among those replicates. And so if you have the time and patience, you can tease out what, where does the uncertainty come from um, in a very almost experimental way. That's, that would be really good if more people would implement that kind of um, sampling of uncertainty around occurrence data because, um, you know, <laughs> everybody's guilty of downloading GBIF data and, and, and using it in, in models without, without thinking about the uncertainty of the occurrence data and having an approach like that where you actually do replicate models that have that account for the uncertainty of location of that occurrence data i think that's that would be you know really nice to see implemented more often <laughs> so here, here's our map and you mm -hmm. can see that there are some places where um we knew essentially down to the location of a cave where the person got infected. And then there were these other occurrences where the outbreak had already gotten off the ground before any public health researcher was there present. And so you have these big uncertainty radii. And so what we did was, I think we did 25 of these, but 25 times we chose a random point from within these this circle and a random point within this smaller circle and a random point within this tiny circle. And so essentially this point is, for all intents and purposes, fixed. And this one can wobble around quite a bit. And so we were looking at, when we were showing you these, uncertainty maps that is the variation that comes in because of those points wobbling around so much yeah i'm trying to help a student who has occurrence data <laughs> from uh, from um, collections these are insects and they're old specimens and most of them have just the county and the student's first approach was to use the centroid of the county and 
yes so i had to work with that yeah. that's not you cannot do that <laughs> there's no good way to do it but probably mm -hmm. the best way to do it is random points within the county i'm so the the, the study is is it's, it's an interesting idea. So he has, he collected data, recent data, recent as in, you know, last year or two, two years ago or so. So very, uh, a snap shot in time, very recent. And then he has these old uh, occurrence data that are, you know, just county level. And so he wanted to compare models from these county level data versus current GPS, but just you know, last two three years of data. Um, so I think I think the idea is interesting, but the implementation has we have to be very careful. So I, I'm I'm trying now the approach of sample with data, running samples, running the models as samples with data. So assigning instead of assigning the um, environmental conditions at the centroid, I'm using the average of the entire you know county for that <laughs> for, for that point mm -hmm. for that presence point is like an average of you know probably you know lots of pixels so it's but again there are, being aware of of the uncertainty of occurrence data and and reporting it is is very important so yeah it's interesting uh these two things we just you just discussed the uncertainty that can be derived from data directly, which is occurrences and, and environmental data. It relates to what Tom talked about uh, uh, in errors or biases that end up in uncertainty, which are related more directly to accuracy of the model rather than variation or variability. And it's an important dimension, which is even more difficult to measure because measuring dispersion in data, in results, is not that difficult. It's just a matter of doing certain things. But knowing the accuracy of data, how biased the data is, it's really complicated. And it's a dim dimension which is even more scarce in the literature, but also more difficult to measure. And those two factors uh, need to be uh, need to be uh, we need to be aware of those things every time we're doing models and the only way to reduce the initial uncertainty related to accuracy or biases in data is to like being very careful with the data cleaning processes filtering processes and if you have to doing like something carefully like what Mona is trying to do with Examples when you just need to do the model and, and the data doesn't allow you to do it the conventional way, then try different ideas and explore, making it, making it like experimental like Tom said. And that's not gonna guarantee that your models are more accurate, but at least it's going to give you an idea, a good idea of what could have happened if some decisions are, are made. I'm going to show people a result from uh, some analyses that that we're doing in the the KU group right now. Um, it's just going to take me a second to get there. Supposedly, it's just going to take me a second to get there. Well, let's see. Here we go. Sorry about this. There we go. So this is just, this is a, a projection for an invasive species. And it's just an interesting view of how different assumptions come to play. So in the left-hand column, you see using raw environmental variables 
And in the right hand column, you see principal components. And in the top row, you see data thinned just based on a, mac a minimum of 50 kilometers between points. Whereas in the bottom row, you see reducing oversampled countries down to some density that matches most countries. Now, I don't know which of these four sets of assumptions is the correct one. And so the best thing that we could do is to do all four of them and to ask how much variability is there among them. And so you see that in all four cases, the Eastern US and Pacific Northwest are the hotspots, right? There's no, no real variability around that answer. But the suitability of the interior West, or even the relative suitability of Mexico and Central America, it is pretty seriously affected by these assumptions. So, you know, my, my maxim is if I have a conceptual reason why I should do something or do something else, then I'll do it. I will follow that conceptual guide. Obviously, I'll think and make sure that my concepts are well-founded. But if, if the concepts say that I should do something, I'm just going to do that. But if, on the other hand, I don't have a conceptual guide, then I'm going to do both or all. And I think, you know, probably Mona remembers times when I did that 20 years ago when, when she was uh, in, the, in the progenitor of that, that working group. And Marlon sees it now where sometimes it leads you to kind of ridiculous numbers of uh, model replicates or you know alternative models but I think it's a good guide for science where if a theoretical understanding tells you to do something do it and if you don't have a theoretical reason a conceptual reason why you should do something then don't make arbitrary choices <clears throat> yeah, it, it would be. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say I agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, sometimes I try to, when I see an element, so when I review a paper and I see an element that could, that is uncertain and could change the outcome, I try to suggest a sensitivity analysis. Why don't you, you know, um, test several scenarios of this parameter or this assumption that you make. I never get, I never convince the, <laughs> the few times that I try to, to ask or try, I asked and I tried to convince the authors that a sensitivity analysis would be, would be really interesting here. It's like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we are done with this study. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that it's horrible when you have to go back to that study and do new analyses. So it's better to do them as part of your initial analyses. But yeah, I mean, it's as a reviewer, it's pretty hard to enforce rigor because typically the authors write a rebuttal that's like, um, the effects of such and such were seen to be minor in this other study published 14 years ago of some other organism in some other place. They find some excuse and editors often let them get by with it. So I've actually become more, shall we say, binary as far as um, my opinions about papers. If there's something that I disagree with that amount, I'm very black and white. And I say to the editor, this cannot be accepted unless this is done. And even so, sometimes it gets, it gets accepted. But I, I basically have stopped being gray, although the hair doesn't uh, look it. I've stopped being gray, and I'm either very positive or very negative. 
And to keep myself honest, I sign my reviews. Mm -hmm. Almost always. I never sign my reviews. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm never, well, I don't know. I try to be constructive and not, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the authors, when they read some of my comments, are like, oh, give me a break. <laughs> Signing reviews is scary, and there are a few times when, you know, usually it's when one of my students could be affected negatively by my having pulled a paper to pieces, then maybe I won't sign it. But I'd say 90% of the time I sign my journal paper reviews. Hmm. So. There is, an, there is. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say another question, but. Go. Do you have anything no, else no. to add? No. <laughs> what question? Uh, there, there was many, uh, there was not one, but various questions that uh, say something about uh, how can I reduce uncertainty? And how can, uh, like, wh how can I know what factor increases uncertainty in my model so I can reduce it or something like that? So, my answer is, you children, uh, the uncertainty comes from distinct factors. You can artificially reduce it. It's easy. You don't want uncertainty from replicates, don't do it. Uh, you don't want uncertainty from GCMs, you just won. But that's not correct. We know that. Uh, you don't want uncertainty from RCPs or distinct emission scenarios, don't use it. But that's never going to be published right now. Like people knows the importance of using this thing, at least GCMs and scenarios. Replicates is a different matter, and it depends on on the reviewer. But replicates also allow you to see what will happen if some of your data is not considered uh, when you're doing the model, and especially depending on the way you're doing the replicates. For example, bootstrapping is gonna do a bootstrap of your data, some of them may be uh, omitted once in one of the replicates, but not in the others and so on. And that's kind of neat because we don't have complete information. So it's, it's nice to see what can happen. And of course, there are factors that increase uncertainty derived from replicates, for example. When you have few occurrences, you are more prone to uh, have huge ranges or variance or standard deviation in your results because <clears throat> if one of those conditions that are represented in one or two of the occurrences are omitted one in one of the replicates the, the results can change uh, significantly but it also depends on how heterogeneous is the environment that the species is using because if all the occurrences, even if they are just 10, are in very similar conditions, probably not much variation is going to be perceived from replicates. But if they are one in mountains, one set in mountains, or others in lowlands and wetter and drier conditions, that's going to increase a lot the variability from the replicates. So my my recommendation is try to do what you have to do. Know what you, what's going to reduce variability in your models, and yes, it's it's different depending on the amount of data, but that is what it is. You don't you don't have to try reducing uncertainty or variability. Let's say like that in your in your study just by reducing the things you do that you really have to do. That's a good point. Um, I mean, obviously, more data and more high quality data, or the same amount of data but getting rid of bad quality data, you know, those may be steps that you need to do if you see that your study's conclusions are very uncertain. But whatever the final status of the data is, you know, if you have 18 points, you have 18 points. If that's what exists for your species, that's what you have. And then you should report honestly the amount of uncertainty that's involved. 
There's a, a really interesting question on, or at least I think it's really interesting on 2411. It says, are the evaluation metrics related to uncertainty or are they a completely different thing? I mean, if I get a good value of evaluation, can I assume that the uncertainty is low? Aha, good question. So, yeah. And you had, you had a, um, I looked at your slides, but I didn't watch your presentation. <laughs> so you had a slide about precision. So the uncertainty, the sources, I guess the combined sources of uncertainty. So you had bias and error and then precision and variation and those feeding into uncertainty. So maybe, maybe the question, this question was triggered by maybe by that, that slide. I'm not sure. Um, a quick answer would be that um, you can have you can have a model with a high AUC, but that doesn't mean that the model is certain. I would say so. There's uncertainty that is not related to AUC. Would be how how well does the model discriminate between presence and and the background? Uh, but the uncertainty of the model could be related to the uncertainty of your uh, environmental data, the uncertainty, the, I don't know, combination of parameters that, that you used in the model. So anyways, I, I wanted down now to, to ask you if you think this question is related to that slide that you had there. Because I, again, I didn't listen to the talk. Sorry, I was I was shutting up my phone. Which slide? Oh, so uh, sorry, the slide that has the bias. Um, I, it's slide I don't know what number, but has the bias and error on the left side, and precision and variation on the uh, right okay. side, and those feed into uncertainty. Okay, I mean, yeah, I may have been stimulated by that slide. I'm not sure. Um, they're certainly related, which is to say an immensely uncertain model is probably unlikely to give really good predictions, but it could. Mm -hmm. To me, the big difference is when we evaluate a model, we're doing an overall assessment about is this model good enough to support the kinds of conclusions that we want to derive from it. When we're looking at uncertainty, we're looking not overall, but rather we're looking um, across the map, kind of within the model, what parts of it are more or less certain. So, you know, here, when we were looking at this map, we see parts of my prediction that have zero variation and parts that have pretty high variation, right? And so in a sense, we're looking at the details of the map and, you know, cause we're not, we're not necessarily setting out to just get a good model that gives an answer, but rather our models are a bunch of different answers about different parts of the region that we're interested in. And so I think, a, a, you know, the, the key thing about assessing uncertainty is that you're assessing it spatially. Mm -hmm. And that's going to tell us, you know, kind of what parts of this, of this model prediction are really believable, and really firm, and what parts of it are not. But that's pretty unrelated to whether it's a good prediction or not. Yeah, so you uh, could have a... Yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say you could have a model with high uh, evaluation metrics, but then you could have areas of, of the prediction, the geographic prediction, areas that have high, uncer uh, high uncertainty. Exactly. And in fact, you do. Yes. Almost without fail, you do. Um, and in fact, in two weeks, we're gonna kind of wrap up our model evaluation section with a talk by Sara Mortara from Brazil, which is about um, ways of evaluating models that don't depend on prediction. And 
essentially the focus of that is the relationship between uncertainty pixel by pixel and suitability. Hmm. And so essentially asking, essentially it's the idea that a good model will have pixels that are predicted as very suitable or very unsuitable, but both with very low uncertainty. If all of your predictions of high or low suitability are also highly uncertain, that's not a very informative model. So that's kind of research in process in progress that Sara has been working on with Marlon and uh, Luis and me and a couple others. So they are related, but I think I think you're right that you can get a really good summary evaluation and still have parts of your map that are very nebulous. Yep. One more question. I, I had one, but I don't remember now. <laughs> uh, Do you so remember what it was about? What was the question? No, that, that's the bad thing. <laughs> I was too <laughs> concentrated in your conversation. <laughs> Uh, so this top one, 2409, how can we determine the source of uncertainty in our modeling approaches, especially when we use prepared products like GBIF data, WorldClim data, Chelsea? I mean, the only thing we can do is use variable X or not, or do some correction on presence absence data. Is that enough for reducing the uncertainty? That, those are two questions. But how can we determine the source? Well, that's, that's essentially exploratory modeling. So you mentioned WorldClim and Chelsea data, both climate data sets. And they are different, obviously. And there are a bunch of others out there. Well, why not develop your models based on WorldClim data and separate models based on Chelsea data and separate models based on Mariclim data, et cetera, et cetera, and see how different they are. If they all give you the same answer, then that's not an important source of uncertainty. And with the GBIF data, that's actually not a prepared product. It's a bunch of points and you, you would know how you use them. You might use the observational data separately from the specimen data. You might use new versus old data. You might filter your data to uh, the ones that have a coordinate uncertainty less than 500 meters. But I think you do a certain amount of experimentation just like what I showed you with that invasive species prediction. You say, well, I don't know whether I should thin my data by distance or by country. And I don't know whether I should use raw environmental data or, or principal components data. Do the experiment. If you get exactly the same answer, then that's a pretty low source of uncertainty. And if you get wildly different answers, you should be worried about it. And the tools in KUENM that, that Marlon was mentioning can help you visualize not just the magnitude of the effects, that histogram that I presented, but also the spatial distribution of that uncertainty that derives from a particular factor. <clears throat> And thanks to that, I remember the question I was talking about. Uh -huh. uh, one of the questions said uh, that you presented one map in which there was apparently no variability, uh, but the person said, but what about if all variability in all regions is the same and is high? Well, that's a good question. Uh, presenting no pattern of variability 
is is an is an is one thing, and, and the amount of variability in that uh, in those pixels is a different thing, and it's important to have a difference. But what Town showed was uh, a picture with maps of variability from distinct sources, and those figures were uh, the scales of those figures were uh, shared, which means variability in one map is in relationship to the others. And so the one that presented like no pattern was also low variability. And that's something that you had to be aware of when you're presenting this kind of result. It's important to give the, the, the reader or whatever, the, whoever the person is that is reading your work or seeing your work, an idea of what's the amount of variability in those distinct maps and the pattern of variability. So that, the one that is in light, green, blue, something, has also low variability according to that scale. So all those maps should be scaled similarly. And the only one that presents certain pattern of some variability apart from parameters is GCMs, as you can see, a few scattered areas. So That's, this, yeah. is, this is really useful because you may be worried about the effect of, I don't know, different assumptions that went into selecting your parameter values. Well, you can see that if your interest is just this area, that doesn't really affect your question. But if you're interested in this area or the whole region, it does. And you can see here that the differences amongst GCMs and how they translate into model outcomes, they're really focused only in this region and not much in the rest of, of the region. Yeah. And sometimes it's cool to see that sources of variation are complementary. So whenever the variation from some source is, is high in one region, like those regions in which you have low variability coming from that source, you can have high variability coming from a different source. And so those, those kind of like questions and ideas, when you're presenting the results and the, as well, uh, need to be considered. You have to be careful about those things. Okay, I think we're out of time because I have another meeting coming up. Mona looks like she does too. Um, yes. <laughs> thanks, Marlon. Thanks, Mona. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And as of Monday, we have Rob Anderson talking about uh, an overview of model evaluation. And then I'll give a little bit more detail about essentially prediction-based model of evaluation approaches. So tune in next week and uh, thanks everybody. Thanks Mona, thanks Marlon. Bye. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>